age proponents are placing remarkable responsibility on our teachers. In my book, Gods of the New Age, I quoted Dr. Pierce, a professor of education and psychiatry at Harvard University. He made this statement at a seminar on childhood education in 1973 and reaffirmed it in a phone conversation. He said, every child in America entering school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with certain allegiances toward our founding fathers, toward our elected officials, toward his parents, toward a belief in a supernatural being, toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It's up to you teachers to make all these sick children well by creating the international children of the future. In an article entitled, A Religion for the New Age, published in The Humanist, we find these words. The battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity and the new faith of humanism. Now the world's figured this out long ago. Uh, they realize that if you want to form the mind of the next generation, start when they're young. So the, the move towards environmentalism and, and social justice and all the things that we hear being spoken about in, in school, in, in public school and in secular education, we're talking about them being global citizens and their responsibility to the earth and, uh, and environmentalism because the earth is a living, breathing thing. Uh, the very new age view of, of environmentalism and all of the causes that are behind it. We're also told that there is no God because evolution solves that problem. In every way, every possible you know, scenario, uh, we've moved God out of the way and replaced him with something else that's a rivaling belief. Environmentalism is the political title for the ancient pagan religion of earth worship. In my book, The Evolution Conspiracy, I explained how evolution is the basis, the foundational faith for Eastern mysticism. The idea that the world evolved over eons of time and through millions of death cycles. This is in opposition to the biblical teaching that God created the earth in a moment of time. It was wonderful and death entered through sin. Because creationism is discussed in the Bible, it has been expelled from the classroom, and yet Eastern mysticism, the religion of India, is promoted and actually presented as scientific fact. Environmentalism is also submitted as scientific fact, but it is based on the foundation of Mother Earth worship, the deification of goddess Gaia, and the preservation of nature over human life. In fact, it teaches that saving the whales or whatever endangered species must be preserved, yet allows for the murder of millions of babies aborted in their mother's womb, and this paid for by our tax dollars. Children and naive young people are being targeted in the classroom indoctrinated with an anti-biblical worldview, yet taught to embrace a global one-world spirituality. They have been carefully programming the children in the perspective of a one-world government for many generations. But now, they have also been understanding that they need to give the children a mystical experience. And at least since the mid-70s, People like uh, Jack Canfield, who is an author well known for the Chicken Soup of the Soul series, he was very much involved in other occupations before he became a world famous author of Chicken Soup. He was very involved in education and in fact co-authored an article with a, another educator named Paula Klimek. It was published in the New Age magazine in 1978 in which they talked about education, New Age education for children and how if they were very wise and very careful they could 
worm their way around any parent who might be a little concerned about bringing the children into contact with practices of mandalas, which is an ancient Eastern mystical technique of putting yourself in an altered state of consciousness through symmetrical geometric drawings of mantras, another meditation technique from the East, which takes a word or a phrase to repeat it to put yourself in an altered state, through contacting your wise person, which they called a wise person. And by the way, Jack Hanfield was very careful to point out if any of the parents are concerned about teaching your children how to meet their spirit guides, for goodness sake, don't call it that in the public school classroom. Change the terminology. Call it their special invisible friend, their special counselor, their wise person, their spiritual friend. Whatever it takes to get by those narrow-minded parents who will also, by the way, find themselves objecting to the introduction of centering prayer and meditation techniques, guided imagery visualization techniques, all of the practices that are not only the mainstay of hardcore occultism, but now find themselves in the church. The problem is those kids from Christian homes, allegedly, uh, are going to those schools and they're coming to church and the church isn't offering any kind of a balance. The church is not offering answers to what's being told them in school. There's nobody that is filling the void of all of the questions that are being addressed to them in a secular school that makes no provision for God. And by the time that they come around to the church, they're not getting it there either. What was the purpose of bringing in these ancient occult practices into the school? The purpose is very simple. If you can give a child an experience, a spiritual experience at an early age, then you have likely got him for life. He will be converted. If you can program him into your way of thinking from the time he's young, you will indeed find it very difficult to see him depart from it as he grows older. So they're bringing these practices in, and it wasn't just in the 70s and 80s. These things have been focused in on the gifted and talented children who were viewed and are viewed as being the potential leaders of the government and the business world and society and the church. And so especially the brilliant children were being given projects on building their own Ouija boards and studying about palm reading and learning how to do meditation techniques and what the gurus did. Of course, no mention of biblical Christianity. Also along uh, during that time period, there was uh, the birth of transpersonal psychology. And one of the very important elements was uh, the practice of shamanism. And of course, shamanism is uh, what we know as uh, being a witch doctor or a medicine man, something that has traditionally been associated with tribal cultures. But these uh, individuals uh, would go into altered states of consciousness through drumming and would access the information from spirit guides, animal spirits, what have you. Well, uh, Dr. Michael Harner put together an organization called the Center for Shamanic Studies, and he began giving seminars to uh, many professionals, many of them doctors and therapists and counselors, on how to access shamanic states of consciousness to help their clients in their uh, you know, personal problems. And he began training uh, tens of thousands of um, Westerners, most of them professionals. And uh, many, many uh, psychologists were trained in shamanic practice. A lot of this activity became known as the personal growth movement. Uh, a lot of self-help books, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, began to uh, uh, illustrate that meditation was necessary to move from your lower self or ego self to your higher self. And this uh, is exactly what the Alice Bailey prophecies were about, that you, uh, you would use uh, mantras, you would use focusing on your breathing, which was very much opposed to biblical meditation. By the time the 80s came rolling around, the New Age movement, which in the 60s was known to be connected with Eastern mysticism, had legitimized itself as body-mind science and permeated into the health industry, posing as beneficial body betterment, promoting programs like yoga for better health. 
It also claimed medical legitimacy through the holistic idea, the idea that the whole is one, that body, mind, spirit needs to be treated as a whole. The Bible prescribes good health through a relationship with the Creator God and using His moral standards for a good life. But Eastern mysticism leans on the influence of supernatural powers called spirit guides or energies and invites them to help with the healing process. The Bible calls these entities, energy or whatever, demons, fallen angels who are under the leadership of the serpent, which in Eastern mysticism is deified as a good power. These two worldviews are in stark opposition to one another, one under the abeyance of a creator God and his principles, the other turning to Eastern mysticism's spirituality to be involved in the healing. A Christian cannot approach health through this Eastern holistic view, which justifies itself as bona fide science. In the 80s, was a very important decade in this movement because it started to move away from the counterculture base that it had in the 60s and 70s and started to move into more of mainstream society in the sense of people who would normally be interested in mysticism. And this was done primarily through the recovery movement. The holistic movement was another way in which Eastern mysticism has infiltrated Western society as well as the church. The holistic movement in the East sees the mind, the body, the soul of an individual as an entire whole unit which can be healed by means of spirit through an aligning of the key force or the prana, the energy force that surrounds us all and a balancing of those psychic forces, they believe that they can bring healing not only to the body, which used to be the territory of, of medicine, but to the mind and the spirit as well. Uh, John Bradshaw had written uh, two best-selling books at the time, Bradshaw on the Family and Healing the Shame that Binds You. Both have sold, you know, uh, I think two million copies each. Well, Bradshaw, in his... Uh, uh, in one of his books claims, I think it was the second one, Healing the Shame That Binds You, that he had been trained or initiated into Kriya Yoga by uh, actor Dennis Weaver, who was a uh, minister in the Church of Self-Realization, which was founded by Swami Paramahansa Yogananda in Los Angeles. So John Bradshaw actually became a Hindu mystic by embracing this practice, and then he incorporated into his books, like in, in his... in. Uh, both his books, he said that uh, uh, our true self is our God self and that we uh, are, in essence, microcosms of the universe. Each one of us is one with all that exists, which is the Hindu concept of God. In the Leadership Academy, um, in the Anthony Robbins organization, it's, it's the, one of the major topics is body, mind, and spirit. And in the spirit, he talks about um, oneness with the universe. He, he talks about uh, yoga, meditation, um, controlling you know your spirit and connecting you know in the, with the universe. Um, with the mind, he talks about controlling your mind, the the driving forces to get you there. Whether it's coming from a, a negative force or a positive force, it's still forces that you have the ability to tap into and use them to just get yourself to take action. This whole um, holistic approach of the body, mind, and spirit is um, anti-biblical, and it's all a part of the New Age. One of the things that um, really gave the New Age movement a tremendous boost in the 1990s was the rise of the holistic health movement, also known as the mind-body-spirit movement. Um, in this movement, meditation was not so much called meditation, but it was called mind-body experiences, mind-body practices. This was the term that described uh, classic Hindu meditation. One of the major proponents of this movement was a man named Dr. Deepak Chopra, who originally was connected with transcendental meditation and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, Deepak Chopra is a mentor for Anthony Robbins, and at the time I didn't know that Deepak Chopra is um, 
uh, his beliefs and his backgrounds are heavy rooted in Eastern mysticism. Um, so I've, um, in, in the fluff of having the job and the excitement and being a part of something I believe was so great, um, I didn't realize how deeply rooted um, the, the beliefs were in what the organization, in the Anthony Robbins organization, in the motivational industry, how similar it is. Um, it was um, camouflaged to, to make you feel that it is all about just the better you and it is all about um, just mind science, which, which seems like it's no big deal. But the actual rituals that go on in the seminar business in regards to uh, the trances they put you in, the state of mind, and putting into, into, into deep demonic states of mind is um, even at that point, because I was in it when I was selling it, um, I, didn't, I thought that was all a part of mind science. It wasn't until I became a Christian and started studying you know, God's word is where I see that it is, it is demonic. It is a spirit, it's the wrong spirit, and it's wa walking in total darkness. Deepak Chopra is an advocate of Eastern meditation. He was a disciple of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and is also an Ayurvedic practitioner of Hindu medicine. He is a classic Hindu medicine man, a shaman who promotes Eastern spirituality based on Eastern medicine. Ayurveda is a herbal-based medicine, a tribal medicine, that has been practiced in India for centuries. Chopra presents it as a science because he believes his Hindu religion is based on true knowledge and is therefore science. In Sanskrit, Ayurveda means complete knowledge. Therefore, to a Hindu who follows mind-body holistic thinking, it is science and true. This is a religious claim, not a medical claim or a scientific claim. One only has to go to India to see that Indians are not super specimens of mind-body health. It simply isn't true. Ayurvedic medicine is grounded in the idea of oneness, the whole, that self is divine. This is a holistic approach and incredibly today the Christian church is inviting this Eastern mystical spirituality into the church, promoting it and not the biblical worldview. Rick Warren, who is called America's pastor by Time magazine and has a huge congregation of 22,000, introduced the idea of holistic medicine in his decade of destiny through his Daniel plan. He invited three New Age doctors, a Muslim, Dr. Mehmet Oz, a Jew, Dr. Mark Hymans, and a Christian mystic, Dr. Daniel Amen, who between them promote Eastern mystical concepts of transcendental meditation, Japanese Reiki healing, India's darkest Tantra yoga, and other meditations as part of their wellness program from Rick Warren Saddleback Church. Rick Warren is emphasizing that all of this is scientifically provable and is not concerned about the spiritual dangers of this use and practice to his Christian congregation. Many in the Christian world feel there is no problem with adopting these Eastern practices of holistic medicine, treating body, mind, spirit, uh, into the church. They feel that yoga can help them gain flexibility and relax. It can help calm the nerves and soothe their mind as they learn relaxation techniques. They bring in techniques of Reiki, an ancient Tibetan mystical technique designed to align the spirit and balance the energies around the body and bring healing and alignment through the channeling of spirit guides that are going to help facilitate the balancing of those Eastern energies. Yoga has now been embraced wholeheartedly, not only by parishioners sitting in the congregations and the pews, but by the pastors themselves, who actually open up the sanctuaries to allow Christian yoga classes to be conducted there with the mystical sound of Om symbol from Sanskrit being placed prominently next to a crucifix on the altar. Woodstock's Guru Godman 
Swami Sitchidananda taught the importance of yoga, which is to unite the self with the all, to transcend the body and mind and realize your own guruhood. He says, every one of you is a guru. In truth, in reality, guru is not a person. Guru is omnipresent consciousness, which pervades everything, which guides the entire universe constantly, is a steady wisdom, that divine within, the God within you. You are ignorant of your guru within. Guru is the teaching. The teaching will always be there. The teaching is the guru. You will realize your own guru within, that guru constantly guides you in all your efforts in life. Among Satchitananda's many celebrity followers is the famous Dr. Dean Ornish, a well-respected scientist and an author who is an avid promoter of Eastern holistic approach. In his cardiovascular field of medicine, he features the practice of yoga, vegetarianism, Eastern meditation, and the teachings of his guru about the God within, the higher self. Dr. Dean Ornish, who wrote a book called Reversing Heart Disease, and in this book, he dedicated it to his guru, to his Swami. And there was a whole chapter in that book called Introducing Your Heart to a Higher Self. This is what I'm talking about. For the first time, we had a melding of medical science and Eastern mysticism and people were, were being presented with the practice of meditation, uh, which was a classic Hindu spiritual practice, not so much to change your religion, but to improve your health. The practice of acupuncture, also with its roots in Eastern, ancient Eastern mysticism, that seeks through stimulating the nerve centers and the energy points to balance the flow of energy, the key energy that helps align the body so that the psychic centers can be more easily opened and activated, helping the person come into union and an experience of their inherent personal divinity. So these techniques really have only as a side line the intent of helping you relax or balancing your body. The basic philosophy behind it in Eastern mysticism is to align that psychic energy force so that you can feel that flow of energy rising up through your body that will help facilitate your experience of inner divinity. Many people confuse Eastern terminology and psychological rhetoric to mean one thing when it actually means something quite different. For instance, energies, the idea of aligning one's energies, allowing the energy to flow through you. This is an Eastern mystical idea teaching that the spirit world, the supernatural, can come into the body and use the body. The Bible describes these as demons and tells us to not have anything to do with them. Wayne Dyer has written 30 books on spirituality, and together they have sold 50 million copies. I've heard him say, this is, uh, he was on, the, on television, he said these energies come down and possess him and he writes his books under, you know, he's no different from Malice Bailey. He's writing his books under the auspices of this energy that possesses him. But people don't realize when they're reading his books, even though he quotes Jesus and tries to present himself as being some kind of a, a Christian, you know, a spiritual person, that what he writes about is the polar opposite of what Christianity teaches. And this is taking people away from the gospel and the saving power of Jesus Christ into something that is in a completely different realm. Yoga disciplines are practiced to alter the mind state through visualization, the idea that the inner, the self within, is actually part of the all outside. The idea is to lose your individuality and merge with everything outside. Self-realization, self-actualization means that you, through an altered state, come to the idea that you are one with everything. This is a pantheistic idea that God is in everything and everything is God. One of the major repercussions 
of uh, the explosion of mind-body medicine was the popularity of yoga. And these practices that many people think are mere stretching are basically limbering you up for meditation, that meditation is very much an uh, integral part of yoga, and even the asanas themselves have spiritual connotations. So many, many people embraced yoga for fitness, but then wound up embracing Hindu spirituality as a result. At the beginning and end of every yoga class, the yoga teacher will go, Namaste, and the students will respond, Namaste. Now in Sanskrit, that means the God in me bows down to the God in you. We now see yoga as being an integral part of uh, Western culture. Practically every uh, fitness center, every spa, every health club offers classes in yoga. And I believe yoga was one of the major things that uh, brought respectability to uh, New Age spirituality. The concept of samadhi, the concept of uh, the divine and all is now considered to be quite normal, whereas before it was considered to be uh, uh, flaky, or weird, or even blasphemous. If one goes to the fitness section, I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about if you go to the fitness section of any secular bookstore and look through the books on yoga, you will find terms like samadhi, kundalini, chakras. These all have spiritual connotations. Samadhi is this mystical state where you are one with the universe. Uh, kundalini is this fiery serpent energy that goes surging up through the spine. Chakras are these energy centers that uh, uh, produce psychic powers and the sense of that you are divine. Now, one of the very clearest signs of a kundalini awakening has always been these kriyas. You see this woman involved in the New Age movement. She's walking along, exhibiting these kriyas happening, involuntary uh, jerking motions. And the staggering thing about it is that we are seeing again and again and again these exact same type of kriyas invading the church. This has always been one of the clearest signs of Kundalini that we know of. A friend of mine from South Africa who's done a tremendous amount of research on this topic says that Kundalini is like a false Holy Spirit. It produces even miracles and healings and fusions of love and power and energy and emotion and uh, all these kinds of things and yet it's the Hindu version of the Holy Spirit and it's not holy. Anything based on the chakra system will inevitably have an occultic outcome. So in essence, energy healing is definitely uh, connected with the practice of witchcraft. Now they present it in a way that's non-religious, they present it in a way that this will help you uh, uh, get rid of your stress, it'll help uh, with your arthritis, you know, it's usually presented in a context of, uh, of physical betterment, you know, as again, you know, producing well-being. As they say, it has nothing to do with religion. You can be of any religion and have it done on you. The source of power in the holistic movement is called the Kundalini force. It's viewed as a psychic, mystical force that in the human being is pictured as a serpent coiled three times around the base of the spine. The serpent is a prominent figure in all of Eastern mythology. It's viewed coiled around the statue of Shiva. It's the positive, it's the good. Virtually every mystical religion and Eastern religion views the serpent power as something to be desired and something to be embraced. The Bible, on the other hand, views the serpent as a personification and an embodiment of Satan. And it's not viewed as a positive thing at all. When you have that introduction of the holistic medicine that has come in through yoga, that has come in through acupuncture and acupressure, through uh, chiropractic, through homeopathic medicine, through the practice of Reiki, an ancient Tibetan mystical system seeking to al align what they call the energy force, which is really a spiritual force that is tied to this serpent power that they're seeking to, to balance and align and raise up. You're desensitizing not only those who practice it, but you're also not aware perhaps, but certainly opening the door, however Christianized your practice of yoga may be, to seducing spirits who will teach you doctrines of demons. You cannot Christianize yoga 
Reiki opens up the channel to psychic powers and communication with the spirit realm. And a number of Reiki masters make reference to their Reiki guides. And even U.S. News and World Report has, uh, has done uh, glowing uh, articles on the acceptance of Reiki in, uh, in hospitals uh, and amongst medical professionals. According to this article, a million and a half energy healers are now at work in the United States alone. The chakra system is, is out of Hinduism and also theosophy, the Western occult tradition. You find it in virtually all occult uh, uh, modalities. Um, the ones that would conflict most profoundly with Christianity are the sixth chakra and the seventh chakra. The sixth chakra is called the third eye chakra and it is associated with psychic powers which the Bible completely condemns. Leviticus 19.31 especially, it says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. There are beings on other planes who want to communicate with you. And this is done through the chakras. These beings on other planes, I believe, are familiar spirits that Leviticus was talking about. Also, the seventh chakra, this goes for yoga, Reiki, witchcraft, all occult systems uh, make reference to the seventh chakra. And in the seventh chakra, when this one opens, you realize that you're God, you're divine. Now, if you're God, if you're connected to God, that means you don't need the cross. You know, you don't need to believe the gospel. If you're already part of God, there's no need for the Christian gospel. It renders it uh, uh, useless. It renders it uh, impotent. So that's what this battle is all about. It's about confusing people. It's about causing people to not understand what the gospel is, the power of God that releases us from sin and provides a way to have a relationship with him that will last for eternity. Anthony Robbins talks about unleashing the power within, and that is so much a part of his organization because that's what he calls his series of seminars, Unleash the Power Within. The power that he's talking about is your human potential, uh, rating yourself from a two and going to a, a level 10. And once you're a level 10, you are a god. You can walk on water and you can accomplish anything that you want in your life. And it's all those driving forces that allow you to do it. Whether it's negative, it can get you there. If it's positive, it can get you there. And it's learning how to manage and massage all the bad things that happened in your life to get what you want in life. You go there believing that you are going to get something that is going to complete you, that is going to be getting you to where you want, that you're going to get enough. And this is where the, it's, it's a counterfeit, it's a fake, because you're always going to look for the next seminar. You're always going to look for that next book because you're always searching for what you're longing for. But what you're longing for is in Jesus Christ. And what these seminars, how they deceive you is they tell you that you got to come to the next one. You got to go, you got to look out for the next thing. And you constantly going there trying to make yourself better and make your life better, but it doesn't get better. The cross is the central focus of Christianity. The cross is the the hope of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, being now justified by his Christ's blood, Romans 5, 9. The cross and the word, the, the gospel, is all that is necessary. It was Paul who said that the teaching of the cross, or the preaching of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who believe, it is the power of eternal life. Paul was able to say in Romans 1, 16, that he was not ashamed of the gospel, because it was the power to salvation to all who would believe, to first the Jew and the Gentile. What he goes on to say is that in it, the gospel, the teaching of the cross, the atonement, all of that, in it is the righteousness of God revealed. God is righteous. He's a God of justice. He's a God of righteousness and perfection. Satan hates the gospel, but the gospel is the power of God, and we must proclaim it until the end.